wanted to share one little picture with you just before I get started this morning. Hopefully you can see that down the, just in the corner of my screen there. Uh, this is one of the things I wanted to share about the trip that I had to the U.S. Uh, about two weeks ago, I think it was. Um, one of the greatest sort of blessings and opportunities that I had was on the morning of the flight that I was going to America. I was in London Heathrow, and I had just walked into one of the waiting areas for one of the terminals. And I had sat there. It was about 6.30 in the morning. It was quite early in the morning still. But I noticed there started gathering a group of Jewish men. And they had their tallit. They had their tefillin. They were, you know, fully, fully geared up and ready to pray. And so they started praying. Um, and it was just a real blessing to be a part of that, even, even at a distance, because I knew, you know, I couldn't put my tallit on that says Yeshua on the back and go up there and, um, be a part of what they were doing at the moment. But it was a blessing to be a part of this from a distance, but my spirit started being stirred as I saw this sort of being undertaken. Because what I recognized as I looked at the guys that were there, and you probably can't see it in the photo because I realize it's a little bit small. But what I realized as I looked at each one of the individual guys there was some of them looked a little bit different from the others. Some of them, and I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but you know they wear the heavy black coats. They wear these big black coats. Some of them will take that coat halfway off, so they'll leave one shoulder out. I believe it was their left shoulder. And they will tie the coat in the front so that the coat is going across them, sort of across their chest. Now, there was only about three or four that did that, and some others looked completely different from that. Some were in all white, some were in traditional, what you would think of, of Jewish, uh, Jewish wear. But they were all together there, and they were all praying. But there was a burden on my heart that God laid on my heart, and he was really testing me to see how brave and bold I would be, because I talk a lot about we need to stand up and we need to talk about what the truth is. But God tested me in this instance. And so I prayed he would give me the opportunity, and he did. So one of these Jewish guys came around. He sat down behind me. Um, only for a brief while, but then he stood up and he sort of stood right beside me. So I stood up and I talked to the young guy and he was, he was young, much younger than me, I think, probably in his early thirties, if that. But I had a couple of questions I wanted to ask him, some questions that God laid on my heart. And then first question I asked him, I already knew the answer to the question, but I asked him this, I said, why is it that you don't have a blue thread in your zit zit? I already know the answer to this, but he went on to explain that because if we use a blue thread in our zitzit, we don't know specifically what that color blue is supposed to be. So it would actually, and he used the Hebrew word, it would actually be a sin if we had this blue thread in our zitzit. Now, I already knew that that's what they believed. I knew that's what they know. I do just want to reiterate for everybody that's listening to me, Hashem never says it has to be a specific color blue. He never once in Torah says it has to be a specific color blue. He only says you have to have a blue thread because that's the whole purpose not that it's one blue, but that it is blue. But I knew that already. So I let that question go by and I said, yeah, okay, I understand that. And then as I stood there, I had already on my, on my phone, I had already opened up Esword. I've got the verse, uh, the, the scripture in front of me that I wanted to read to him. But I took him to Zechariah and I said it that way. I said, can you ex try to explain this scripture verse to me? Because I've been struggling with this. And I thought maybe a Jew could explain this to me. Can you help me try to understand this verse in Zechariah? And as soon as I said Zechariah, his eyebrows sort of went up like, okay, this guy's not just talking about, you know, normal Christianity here. He, he might know something about what it is he's saying. So I take him to the verse in Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. And this will be a very familiar verse to you, but it's the one that God laid on my heart that I should bring to him. And that verse says, and I will pour out on the house of David and on those living in Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer. And they will look to me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will be in bitterness on his behalf, like the bitterness for a firstborn son. So the question that I asked this Jewish brother as he stood there was, can you explain to me who this man is? Who is it that Zechariah says they will look upon him as the one that they pierced and they will mourn for him as an only son? And brothers and sisters, this put him on the back foot. He was surprised to see this verse, number one, and he was surprised that somebody was asking him about this. And the only words that he could manage to utter to me was, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. And then he looked at his watch and he quickly said, I've got to go. 
And brothers and sisters, the, the truth of the matter is, and the truth of what I believe is, he knows exactly who I'm talking about. And he knows exactly who this man is. And the rabbis know exactly who this man is. But they're terrified of it. They're terrified of it. And the reason for that is it's the purpose of what I want to talk about today. And it's what really stirred my spirit. And in a lot of ways, brothers and sisters, it made me angry. This, this interaction with him made me angry. Now, I pray desperately, and I want you to pray with me, that the Father will use those seeds planted and that this young man will go away and ask the question, who is this man? Who is this man? Pray with me that he will do that. But brothers and sisters, the bigger problem that we have and the one that really hurt my heart was that the rabbis are holding these young men hostage. They are holding these young men hostage from the very thing that Yeshua came to do, which was to set them free. We need to be honest and we need to be real about Judaism. And I'm talking about modern, secular, rabbinical Judaism. It is holding young men and women, and it's holding all of Judah at the moment, hostage to the truth of who the Messiah is. So I want to share a little bit with you today from this Torah portion, and it's so timely, this Torah portion, that God would lay this on my heart, I would have this experience, and then I, the first Torah portion I would talk about would be this very one. But I want to take you, first of all, to Vayikra chapter 25, verses 9 and 10. It's the first part of the verses that we read this morning. And it says this, Then on the tenth day of the seventh month, on Yom Kippur, you were to sound a blast on the shofar, you were to sound the shofar, all through your land. And you were to consecrate the 50th year, proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It will be a yovel for you. And some translations will say jubilee for you. The Hebrew there is yovel for you. You will return everyone to the land he owns, and everyone is to return to his family. Now, brothers and sisters, as we can see in these verses, there seems to be a significance about the seventh month in Yahweh's calendar, which really isn't that much of a surprise when you think about it. If you know what the number in se uh, number seven in Judaism represents, and if you don't, I'm going to leave that as a bit of homework for you. Go away and see what the number seven represents. Nevertheless, there are three important Moedim, or holy days, that take place during this season. There's Rosh Hashanah, there's Yom Kippur, and there's Sukkot. But today, what I want to do is I want to, take, I want to take a look briefly at Yom Kippur, and along with it, I want to take a look at the Yovel, or the Jubilee, as some of you might know it. Not only do we see that the season of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is where God's people receive atonement and forgiveness, and they're set free from their sins, but we also see that once every 50 years, a Yovel is associated with the season of Yom Kippur. That's very interesting, and that's very important. The Hebrew word Yovel, it refers to a ram's horn or a shofar blast. So what happened was during the Yovel, this shofar blast, it signaled something that was very precious to Israel which not only saved them as a nation and as an entire nation, but brothers and sisters, it also represented something about their individual, hang on to this, their individual salvation. One of the primary purposes of the Yovel was to proclaim freedom. And it's this very concept that the Hebrew word yesha, the word yesha comes from, which is in fact where we get the word for salvation. Most of you know that. Another important translation of this word, and I love this translation, and I bet Bex will too, is liberty. And it comes from the root yasha, which means to be open, wide, or free, to be safe, to rescue, to bring salvation, or to get victory. 
And it's from this root that we get the Hebrew name of the Messiah himself, Yeshua. His name literally meaning he will save. So we can see in association with Yom Kippur and the season of the Yovel, how Yeshua, our Messiah, the one who will save, sets us free from our sins. Now, those of you who are familiar with the book of Hebrews, you'll know that a large portion of the book of Hebrews, it goes into a lot of detail about this because the primary focus of the book of Hebrews is the season of Yom Kippur. One of the verses that represents this very well is Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. Listen to what it says. But when the Messiah appeared as Kohen Gadol, of the good things that are happening already, then through the greater and more perfect tent, which is not man-made, meaning it's not of this created world, he entered the holiest place once and for all. And he entered not by means of the blood of goats and of calves, but by means of his own blood. Listen to this. Listen to the language of Hebrews here. By means of his own blood, thus setting people free forever. Forever. This passage deals not only with the subject of Yom Kippur and the forgiveness of sins, but a major focus of the passage is setting people free forever. Which, brothers and sisters, is the exact theme of the parashah this week and the entire purpose of the yovel. Again, the Hebrew word yovel is symbolic of Adonai's shofar or a horn. But why is that important? Why is it important that the Yovel is symbolic of Adonai Shofar? Brothers and sisters, it's because Yeshua HaMashiach is Adonai's Yovel. He is the Yovel of the Creator. And we can see the link here. The link between Yeshua and the Yovel and how he's connected to Adonai's freedom and salvation. We find this in Luke chapter 1. Verses 68 to 75, where it says this, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he visited and worked redemption for his people. Listen, listen to the language. We know what Yovel stands for. It stands for a horn, right? Listen to what Luke goes on to say. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David even as he spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from the ages before. Salvation from the ones hostile to us and from the hand of all the ones hostile to us to execute mercy with our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to give to us that we being delivered out of the hand of those hostile to us in order to serve him without fear in consecration and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Brothers and sisters, I know it's been a couple of weeks, but can I just go back and remind you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something that's a little bit aggressive today. I'm going to beat my dead horse a few times today, okay? Please forgive me. But I'm going to beat my dead horse right now, and I'm going to remind you, it is all about Israel. It is all about Israel. Every covenant, every promise, everything that Hashem has said, it is all about Israel. And this is why it's vital that you understand who you are. carrying on with this thing, we can see that Yeshua himself, he speaks about himself in connection with the parashah that we're studying this week. Where does he do this? Well, in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21, we read this. Listen to what our Messiah did. Yeshua returned to the Galil in the power of the Spirit, and reports about him spread throughout the countryside. He taught in their synagogues. I love this language and everyone respected him. 
See, this is the thing, brothers and sisters. All the people that ever heard Yeshua speak, they loved him and they respected him. It was the rabbis, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. It was those guys who wanted to maintain their authority over people and who wanted to, to, to hijack the belief system and who wanted to hold the people captive. They're the ones who hated him because they wanted to retain power. That's what it was all about. And this is exactly what's happening in Judaism today. This is exactly what's happening with Judah today. They're being held captive by the rabbis because the rabbis are saying, no, it's not this man that you call Yeshua. He is not the Messiah. We will tell you who Messiah is. And you will listen to our oral tradition and our oral law. That's what you will obey. And they are holding people captive. But Luke tells us that when people heard Yeshua speak, what did they think of him? They respected him. And it goes on to say, now when he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, on Shabbat, he went to the synagogue as usual. Note, brothers and sisters, he did not go down to the First Baptist Church on First Street. He didn't go to the Pentecostal Church. Our Messiah Yeshua went to the synagogue and, the, and it even at tags on the little words as usual because it wants you to understand this was his custom. It was our Messiah's custom to attend synagogue. And on this particular occasion, it says he stood up to read and he was given the scroll of the prophet Yeshiyahu. And boy, it's about to get real because unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of Adonai is upon me. Listen to these words as they come out of our Messiah's mouth. The spirit of Adonai is upon me. Therefore, he has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the imprisoned and renewed sight for the blind, to release those who have been crushed, to proclaim a year of the favor of Adonai. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the Yovel. After closing the scroll and returning it to the Shamash, he sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He started to speak to them. Listen to what he says. Today, as you heard it read, this passage of the Tanakh was fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand. In this act, Yeshua, our Messiah, was proclaiming himself as the fulfillment of Adonai's Yovel. Because it would only be through Yeshua, brothers and sisters, that freedom could truly be proclaimed. Adonai's freedom could not and cannot be found in anyone else. No one else coming to you with another message could promise the same freedom that Yeshua would bring. Although many people have tried throughout the generations, brothers and sisters. And here's what I want you to grab on to today. Anyone, anyone aside from Yeshua who promises you freedom will only lead you into being a slave to corruption and death. And I don't care who it is. I don't care what man it is. I don't care if it's your pastor, your priest, your rabbi, your Sikh, whatever it is, I don't care who it is. Any man that promises you freedom that is apart from Yeshua the Messiah, he will lead you into slavery, corruption, and death. In Kepha Bet 2, 19 to 22, listen to the stark warning that Kepha gives us about these type of people. And these people are very real today. And this, brothers and sisters, is what rabbis are doing today. To our brother Judah, there's, they promise them freedom. But they themselves are slaves of corruption. For a person is a slave to whatever has defeated him. 
Listen to this. Indeed, if they have once escaped the pollutions of the world through knowing our Lord and Deliverer, Yeshua the Messiah, and then have again become entangled and defeated by them. How many people do you know about that today? How many people do you know that God has brought into the revelation of the truth of the Torah, of obedience, of, of what it is to be a believer and a follower in a Talmud of Yeshua our Messiah, and they walk away and they become entangled and defeated by these people yet again because they listen to the people who tickle their ears. They listen to people who talk to them about things they want to be talked about. They listen to people who tell them that their faith and their belief system is what they want it to be rather than what God says it should be. And they get pulled away from people like me who try to share the gospel and the truth and the good news with these people of the only one who can set you free and the only way that you can be set free. And these people walk away and they get entangled and they get defeated. Listen to what Kepha goes on to say about these type of people who have been brought into the understanding of the truth, but they walk away knowingly and willfully. He says their latter condition has become worse than their former condition. He expands the comment and he says it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than fully knowing to turn from the holy command delivered to them. How many people do you know like that? How many people have come along to congregations and have walked away because they have heard some other teacher say, well, no, that doesn't, that doesn't matter anymore. That Torah stuff is not important anymore. Don't listen to people like Josh. Don't listen to these people who are saying you should be obedient. Kepha says it is better that you had never even known the truth than to have known the truth and to walk away from it. And he goes on to say what has happened to them accords with the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. Yes, the pig washed itself only to wallow in the mud. I heard a story this week. It was, a, it was, it was quite kind of funny that I heard. It was talking about a, it, there, was a, there was a chicken. There was a chicken and a pig who was stood by the side of the road and there was this truck that rolled by them. And on the side of this truck, there was an advertisement and it had a, it had a, it had an egg on it and it had some bacon on the, on the side of the truck. And the chicken said, look, we're famous. He says to the pig, look, we're famous. And the pig says to the chicken, he says, well, it's all right for you because all you have to do is lay an egg, but I have to die. You see, the whole point of that story, brothers and sisters, is there are people who are contributors. And there are people who are willing to give their entire lives for something that's real. And this is what Kepha is challenging on us on here. Are you just a contributor to your faith? Are you happy to lay a few eggs, but you're not willing to sacrifice your own life? I'm going to beat my dead horse for a minute here. And I said I would, but I'm going to beat my dead horse and I'm going to repeat myself yet again. One of the primary ways that Yeshua, our Messiah, sets us free, brothers and sisters, sets us free, is through his Father's Torah. It's through his Father's Torah. That's how we actually obtain freedom. Not by your pastor telling you that you don't have to be obedient. By being obedient, you become free. How does Yeshua do this for us? He does it by writing it on our hearts and providing us brothers and sisters. And this is what I bang on week after week after week. He does it by writing it on your heart and then providing you with the power, the desire, and the new nature to be able to implement it in your life. That's what it's all about. But we've got to be very, very clear, brothers and sisters. And this is why I'm so particular with language, particularly when it comes to what we believe, because I, need, I believe that in these end days, we need to be very specific with our language. And we need to be particularly clear when we're speaking to Judah. It is only through Yeshua the Messiah that we can truly grasp the Torah. I will repeat myself again for Judah and everyone else. It is only through Yeshua the Messiah that you can truly 
grasp the Torah. And when you do that through Yeshua, do you know what it does? It does what our brother Steve read to us a little bit earlier. It turns into an Eitz Chaim. It turns into a tree of life for you. It is only through Yeshua the Messiah that the Torah leads to freedom. It is only through Yeshua the Messiah that the Torah leads to freedom. How dare I say that? I say that because the rabbis are holding people hostage. The version of the Torah that they are teaching is not the Torah of Moshe. It is their oral rabbinic Torah. And that Torah does not lead to freedom. It leads to bondage and corruption. And this is why I was so angered when I saw my brothers standing there in all earnesty trying to honor God. All of them thinking they have to look this way or that way or dress this way or that way because one particular rabbi says you have to do it this way as opposed to the other way. They're being held hostage and that infuriates me. The rabbi, the rabbi, Yeshua the Messiah said, I came to set them free. Brothers and sisters, any other application of Torah, make no mistake about my language here. I'm going to be very clear with my language. Any other application of Torah devoid of Yeshua's sacrifice and his blood, any application of Torah devoid of those things will ultimately lead to a dog returning to its own vomit. And I use my language intentionally. Any other application without him will lead you back into bondage and slavery of another man. Make no mistake about it, Judah. The brother of Yeshua, Yaakov, he talks about this in Yaakov 1, 22 to 25. He challenges us, brothers and sisters. He challenges our observance by saying this. Listen, don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says. But do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at himself in a mirror. He looks at himself and he goes away and he immediately forgets what he looks like. But listen to what Yaakov goes on to say. But if a person looks closely into the, listen to his language. Remember, language is important. If he looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom and continues, becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work that it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. Now, let me, I'm going to apologize to my horse again, but here comes the stick. We must, brothers and sisters, remember that when Yaakov wrote these words, Listen to my language because I want to be very specific with my language. The only established word or scripture was the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. He was not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Hebrews. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Revelation even. He wasn't talking about those things. What Yaakov was speaking of here was the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets and writings. Now, it's not meant to take away from those other things. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying, brothers and sisters, is it's all about Israel. It is all about Israel. And every bit of Scripture that comes after that page in your Bible, and most Bibles have this, you have a page that says New Testament, and then you turn that page over and it starts into the New Testament. Every bit of words, every single word that comes after that divider in your paragraph is talking about Israel. And it is proving who the Messiah of Israel is. Listen to my language. I want to be very clear. It's been a few weeks. If you find a verse in the quote-unquote New Testament, which we lovingly refer to as the Brit Hadashah, that you, seem, that you seem to believe contradicts something that Moses wrote or that you find in the Tanakh, brothers and sisters, you have misunderstood that verse. You 
have misunderstood that verse because every single verse in the Brit Hadashah is a confirmation of what was already written by Moses, the prophets, or the writings. Every single word. There is nothing new there. And Messiah proved it himself in Luke where he, where he reads from Yeshayahu. And he says, this is who I am. Do you think that's new? No, it's not new because Yeshayahu already talked about him. Zechariah already talked about him. He's not giving them new information. He's confirming that I am this man. I am this Messiah. That's what he's doing. And that's what the whole Brit Hadashaf should do for you. So having that in your mind, I want you to remember this as Yaakov goes on to say this. Listen to what, listen to what he says in chapter 2, verse 12. Language. Listen to the language. Keep speaking and acting like people who will be judged by a Torah which gives freedom. What? What? I might have misread that. Keep speaking and acting like people who will be judged by a Torah which gives freedom. But wait, wait a minute, Josh. How is that possible? I thought the law was the very opposite of freedom. That's exactly what my pastor gets up and talks about nearly every week. This law thing that God did away with because it was so imperfect. It's the very opposite of freedom. We're now free in our, in our Jesus, in our Messiah. I thought the law is the very opposite of freedom. My friends, let me explain something to you. It's because without the rule of law, it's impossible to have freedom. I'll repeat myself because the language is very important. Without the rule of law, it is impossible to have freedom. You might say, prove it to me, right? Prove it. Okay, I will. Every single free nation in this world is based on this truth. You see, brothers and sisters, some of you might not understand, so let me explain it to you. The law is what establishes what is and isn't acceptable for members of a particular society. And the law is what protects its citizens from anarchy. That's what law is for. And I want to remind you today that in, the, in Ezekiel, you go to Ezekiel and you read about the coming kingdom when New Jerusalem comes down and it's established on this earth, there will be a rule of law established in that kingdom. You know what that rule of law is? I'll give you a hint. Our Messiah Yeshua is going to spend a thousand years teaching this law. That's how critical it's going to be to the kingdom. Do you know what that law is? It's the Torah. It's the Torah. You see, our world and our nations are governed by our laws right now. They're governed by laws created by man. But I'm telling you, there's coming a day, and that day is coming very soon, where we will be made part of a kingdom that is governed by a law created by the creator of this world. And the benefit to us, brothers and sisters, is that he has already given us this law so we can learn to live by it now. So that when we get into his kingdom, we won't look like fools. We'll know what we're doing. Do you see how it all ties together? This is the whole purpose of the Torah. But you see, the problem is, and, and dad often says this, Becky's daddy says this all the time. The problem is, brothers and sisters, we have an adversary. We have an adversary today, and the spirit of Hasatan, it teaches the world and most of our believing brothers and sisters that if they submit themselves to God, if they submit to God, then they're in grievous bondage, and they've got some kind of great big massive yoke that they've put around their necks. But 1 John 5, 2 and 3, it contradicts this notion, and it tells us how to actually measure our spiritual state. Listen to what it says. This is, brothers and sisters, you want to know where you're at spiritually? You want to know if you're a child of God spiritually? Listen to what it says. Here is how we know that we love God's children. 
Yeshua already said this a bit earlier, but let me, this verse reiterates this. When we love God, when we love God, we also do what he commands. Not 10. Not 10. It doesn't say you do 10 of them. It doesn't say that it was only established 10 of them. It says you'll do what he commands. That includes everything. He goes on to say, for loving God means obeying his commands. Well, Josh, how can we do that? How can we? It is impossible for us to be obedient to God's word. It's impossible. No, it's not impossible because he goes on to say this. Moreover, his commands are not burdensome. He's just defeated your argument. He himself says that the commands are not burdensome. And it's his parents, I will remind you. At the very start of John, the, the book of John, it talks about his parents. And it says his parents were perfect or they were righteous before God. Do you know what it takes to be righteous before God? It takes perfection in Torah. And his parents walked perfectly in the Torah. It is not impossible. And it was not impossible before Yeshua came. Right? It's something they could do, and it's something that they did. But our society has changed. The way that we live has changed. Because what I want you to understand, and I'm sorry I'm going on a bit today, but I said I was going to, so you can't hold it against me. You see, the problem with our society, what our society has done, and what has happened to us, brothers and sisters, we need to be honest with ourselves. How many of you will be honest enough today to say and to admit that where you were born and how you were brought up has shaped your opinion and your ideas of what the Bible is and of what salvation is and about who the Messiah is. How many people are willing to say, I will admit that where I was brought up and how I was brought up has shaped my opinion? I'll do it. I'll say I'm willing to say that. I know that being brought up where I was by who I was brought up by, by my parents and the fact that we were we were typical Christians, church, planting churches. I know that the way that I was brought up shaped and formed the way that I believed. But I also know that I was wrong about a lot of things. And I was willing to admit that. And brothers and sisters, we all need to get there. Look, you just need to say, look, you know what? Some of the stuff I was taught was wrong. And I'll just say it was wrong. It was wrong. But God has brought me where I'm at today and he's trying to show me the truth. And I want to accept the truth today. You see, all these people that are out there teaching you that the Torah is a burden, and I'm talking about rabbis as well, because again, this is my grievance today, is with the rabbinic guys telling Judah that you are in subjection to us and not the master. All these people that are out there doing this today, and the pastors in our churches that are doing the same thing, listen to what 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 to 10 tells us. About all this stuff about the Torah doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't, you don't have to be obedient anymore. Listen to what first, uh, Second Thessalonians says. For already, this separating from Torah is at work secretly. This was back in their day, as he's right, writing to the Thessalonians here. For already, this separating from the Torah is at work secretly. Why is that important? Because it shows you this is what is not supposed to be happening. If he's making a point that it's already happening, he's trying to tell you it should not be happening. Do you see how language is important? Listen to what he goes on to say. But it will, on, but it will be secretly only until he who's restraining is out of the way. Then, listen, for those who want to walk this path of Torah doesn't matter anymore, I don't have to be obedient, then the one who embodies separation from Torah talking about the anti-Messiah, will be revealed. The one whom the Lord Yeshua will slay with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the glory of his coming, Baruch Hashem. Listen, you want to walk away? You want to say the Torah is not important? You want to say, how dare you, Josh, try to put a yoke around people's neck? Listen to what it says about this man. When this man who avoids Torah comes... The man who avoids the Torah, when he comes, the adversary will give him the power to work all kinds of false miracles. Again, language 
Look at what the adversary is able to do, brothers and sisters. You thought God was the only one who could give power to people? The adversary will give him all kinds of power to work miracles, which means that not everybody you seeing that is doing miracles is doing it through the power of Hashem. You People all, listen, I'm sorry. People always want to say, God, show me a sign. God, show me reveal to me show me some kind of miracle then i'll believe you guess what the devil can show you a miracle the devil can show you miracles so if all you ever want to see is a miracle and if a miracle is what determines whether you're going to believe or not you're going to be led astray by the devil do not base your faith on what you can see with your eyes it will lead you astray because he'll be able to do all kinds of false miracles and signs of wonders it says the adversary will enable him to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways those who are headed, listen, those who are headed for destruction because they wouldn't receive the love of the truth that they could, that could have saved them. Brothers and sisters, I am ashamed to report to you today that this same spirit teaches in many churches across the world that if you seek to keep God's Torah and His commandments and statutes, you're in bondage to something that's detrimental. But can I show you something beautiful today? Can I show you something beautiful today that I want to give you strength? Can I show you something that I want to encourage you with today? I want to do it through the words of our Master Yeshua. Our Mashiach, listen to what he says in Matthew Yahu 11, 28 to 30. Hear the words of our Messiah as he says, come to me. All of you who are struggling and burdened. Are you struggling today, brothers and sisters? Are you burdened by what's happening in your life? Listen to the words of the Messiah. Come to me, all of you who are struggling and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see, brothers and sisters, there's a fallacy being taught today. And the fallacy is this. The fallacy is that you're born free when you become saved through Jesus. You're now free. No, brothers and sisters. Our Messiah teaches that there still is a burden. And there still is a yoke. But he says, come to me because... My yoke is easy. My burden's light. And for those of you who don't know, and it's one of the great examples I was able to share with one of my friends in America, for, you, for those of you who don't know, a yoke in the days of Yeshua, it was, it was considered to be the teachings of a particular rabbi. They would have their own teachings. They would have their own Torah law. And what they would do is they would put this yoke upon the people or the people would willingly put this yoke around their own necks. And they would live on these, under this heavy burden of what the rabbis had told them they had to live. And this is exactly what's happening with Judah today. Rabbis are still laying this heavy burden, this heavy yoke upon Judah today. So brothers and sisters, the beautiful thing about what the Messiah says here is that when the people heard these words, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, they knew exactly what he meant. They knew exactly what he meant. Follow me as your rabbi, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. You see, brothers and sisters, all of this, this is all part of the great deception. That keeping your God's commands are actually a negative thing. And it's a deceptive twisting of the good news. Specifically, that the only way that you can be free is by staying away from Adonai's Torah. Now, I know to a lot of us here, that's going to seem like something that's common sense for us to reject because it's it's completely nonsense but we need to understand brothers and sisters this is part of the great delusion upon this earth that's being preached from pulpits every single week and in the same way it's being preached in synagogues every single week our parish all teaches us exactly the opposite Specifically, brothers and sisters, that is through submitting ourselves to the God of Israel, His ways, His Torah, His commands, and His statutes, 
by becoming his slaves and his servants that we can have any hope to actually be set free. Now, I know based on our Western logic, that will seem counterintuitive to some people. But I want to explain to you today, this is exactly how the kingdom of heaven works. You see, the truth is, brothers and sisters, there are no free men. None of us. There are no free men. We are all slaves. And the only reason we're not slaves to the world is because we're slaves of Hashem. As we read a little bit further into our parashah, speaking of Yisrael, who, brothers and sisters, hopefully by now you're realizing you are a part of, by Ikra 2542, it says this, For they are my slaves whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, they are not to be sold as slaves. In the very same way, brothers and sisters, if we've been marked for redemption by the blood of the Lamb, and Adonai has brought us out of our own personal Mitzrayim. We're his slaves. We're his slaves. You're not a free man. You're not a free woman. You are his slave. And as his slaves, we cannot be sold as slaves to anything or anyone else. It's impossible. But brothers and sisters, can I put a little caveat in here? Let's not fool ourselves. While we cannot be sold as slaves to anyone or anything else, what we can do is we can repeat the mistakes of ancient Israel by prostituting ourselves with another God. This is why, brothers and sisters, it is vital that we remain vigilant and we hold fast to the truth of the Torah. Now, I know I've been long-winded today, brothers. I had, brothers and sisters, I had a lot of stuff I wanted to get off my chest today. But in closing, I just want to bring everything around. and I'm going to wrap everything up with this. It is only through Yeshua the Messiah that we can truly have access to the freedom that this parashal talks about this week. But let's make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the only way that we can have this freedom is by obeying him. It comes by obeying him. And if we do this, brothers and sisters, John chapter 8, verse 36, it tells us this. Listen to this and let this be, let this be the, the encouraging and the renewing and the refreshing of your soul today for those of us who say, yes, I will be tour pursuant. I will be tour pursuant. Listen to what John 8, 36 says. So if the Son sets you free, you will really be free. Baruch Hashem.